Good afternoon, everybody. Um, hope you're all well. Um, so um, prior to Nigel's um, piece on uh, spatial ecology and COVID-19, um, which uses census data, I'm going to give you a very quick uh, whistle-stop tour of uh, UK census data. Um, I'm the, uh, the head of the uh, aggregate data unit uh, within the UK data service. And I've been involved with census data since 1995, so quite a long time. Um, I, I did a placement um, year from university, uh, the University of Manchester in the, uh, in the computing centre, and, and then I'm glad to say that they, they took me back on and, and I've been working on census data ever since. Um, so if we could have the next slide, please. So we're going to start with a quick quiz. Um, so in 2011, how many people in England and Wales identified their religion as Jedi? And if we get the next slide, we should have a, a way of recording this. So if you go to www.menti.com, uh, use the code 48684600, we should, we should get some answers. <laughs> okay, should we have a look at uh, at how you've got on with that? So census data is it's, it's classic aggregate data. It's counts of things, people um, aggregated to a, uh, a geography. Uh, amazingly, the, the majority of people got that right. It is 176,632 and, and all of these people live amongst us. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the question on Jedi is probably not particularly useful to ourselves unless you're planning on founding a Jedi church. Um, but what if the above diagram was your local area and the numbers represented households where you can identify uh, single parent households, uh, single person households, uh, people living alone. And then if you can add in the characteristics that the, the person living alone uh, was over the age of 60, uh, using that information, we can build up a picture of where in the country we could target resources for looking at vulnerable people who might be shielding from COVID-19. Uh, next slide, please. So the census of population in the UK uh, is held every 10 years. Uh, it was for the first modern census in, in the UK was in 1841. And the data that the uh, census agencies hold is held completely anonymous and secure for 100 years. And they uh, are extremely rigorous in, in that security. Uh, we have digitized censuses from 1971. It says 1961 ongoing. That data is almost ready for release. Uh, uh, we will have that uh, as soon as it's available. Uh, is this, is the 2021 census the last ever census? They say it's going to be, but then they said that the 2011 census was, was the last one that there was going to be. So we don't know. I, I, I personally think that there will be a 2031 census. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and we talk about a UK census, but the, there is no such thing as a UK census. Um, we have different nations, uh, different governments, and, and each of those governments drives the ideas um, for the census. Um, in England and Wales, we have the ONS. Um, in Scotland, we have NRS. And in Northern Ireland, we have NISRA. Um, they all have different but similar geographies. They ask 
different questions at times. They look for different outputs from the census. However, there is a lot of harmonization that goes on. Um, the census agencies talk to each other and they do plan to have harmonization um, across most subjects. Um, next slide, please. So the 2021 census for England and Wales held on the 21st of March, They've had a 97% response rate for that census, which is, is unprecedented. And um, I guess it shows that the, the online um, website they built for recording that uh, was, was actually very good. Um, average completion time for, the, uh, for each census was just 23 minutes. Um, and what we've got going on now um, several months after the census, we've got we've got a census coverage survey going on. So they're looking to see how well it was covered, um, what sorts of people responded, and who didn't. We have got a census quality survey going on, so they will randomly go and talk to people to see um, how they felt about filling in the census. And also, so we can we can cross reference that and see um, if if what they wrote actually tallies with with what um, the uh, questionnaire the, the, the questioner um, can find out. And then we've we've also we've just we've just closed the uh, sorry the ONS has just closed its output consultation. Uh, next slide, please. So a uh, very similar thing going on in. Northern Ireland, I uh, think statistical disclosure control, they are uh, still currently working on the best methods for um, ensuring that the data when it is released um, is not disclosive. You can't find individuals out from that. And the next one, please. Uh, Scotland, Scotland haven't yet uh, had their census. Uh, that'll be taking place on the 1st of March. They uh, suspended their census due to COVID. They have had a very successful rehearsal and a rehearsal of the data processing. Um, and there's a lot of work going on to ensure that people are not counted twice or they're not counted at all. So if they were in England and they moved to Scotland, they don't, don't want to be on both censuses. If they were in Scotland, it, Scotland um, uh, in Last year, well, yesterday, and they moved to England tomorrow, they won't be on any census. So they want to make sure that people are counted somewhere. Um, the next steps, um, lots of Cs, sorry, no, <laughs> lots of Cs. So they're going to compile. 3% um, of the um, census wasn't uh, completed online. So that's a very small number, but it's still a lot of um, paper. So they're going to compile all the paper census returns. They're going to clean the data. Um, they will, for instance, remove duplicate outputs. Um, it does happen that, you know, someone in the house returns, completes a survey, sends it in, and then someone does it online. Um, they're going to complete the year census. So they, they, they want to have 100% coverage. So they're going to fill in the gaps where there's missed or invalid or inconsistent respo responses um, and estimate those uh, who haven't responded using statistical methods. We're going to cross-validate. Um, so they'll be using alternative administrative data um, to QA the, uh, the, the responses. Um, Consultation, so they've, they've consulted with um, local authorities, charities, community, community groups, commerce, and uh, ourselves on what we'd like to appear in, uh, how we'd like the, uh, the outputs to appear. And there's been a lot of work going on on confidentiality. So they, they're working tirelessly to protect anonymity. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry. No, we'll stay on that slide. Sorry. 
So the outputs themselves um, should start to appear a year after census date. We haven't got um, a definite date on that. Um, the first sets of figures will be headline figures. Um, after that, uh, we will get the data in tranches um, with um, the simplest data first with more complex multivariate data um, towards the end. Um, they're looking at a year to two years to get all the data out. So um, the data will appear in ready-made tables, so, so traditional census tables, tables that flex, so tables that you can tweak slightly, and also uh, the ability to build your own tables. So you'll be able to specify the variables you want on that, and then it'll analyze the, uh, the census database, make sure that none of the data you want is disclosed. So if it is, if it is it'll blur that data, and then it'll output that to you. Uh, there are also gonna be links to administrative data as well to fill in gaps or, or add uh, extra value to the, uh, the census outputs. Uh, next slide, please. So what can, what can census data tell us? <clears throat> All sorts. Um, I'm not going to go through that list, but, but, but massive amounts of uh, information. It's, it's gold standard um, social survey data. It covers 100% of the population. Um, no other social survey comes even close to that. Um, it's for a single point in time. Um, so it starts out extremely useful after 10 years. You've got to start to, do, to think about how, how um, populations and lives have changed. Um, those categories uh, of census data, they can be broken down into subclasses. Uh, they can be uh, mixed with other topics. Um, and um, it comes in a number, we have a number of different census products. So we have the aggregate data. We've got geographical boundary data so you can make maps. We've got flow data so we can look at where, how people travel to work and where they travel to work. And we can look at um, how people are migrating within the UK and um, from the UK to abroad and vice versa. Uh, we've got micro data as well. So we can start to look at um, individuals and anonymized ind individuals as well. And then we've got some de derived data as well. So we've got some uh, deprivation data as well, for instance, and spatiotemporal data. So things like uh, in the past, we've had POP 24-7, which has looked at daytime and nighttime populations. Uh, next slide, please. So in 2021, the, the census changed. It, it changes every time we do it. But the, um, in 2021, we've got new questions on gender. Um, Northern Ireland didn't ask the gender question. Um, so we, this is um, a voluntary question uh, about how you identify your, your own gender, as opposed to the sex that was registered at birth. Um, next slide, please. We had a question on sexuality in all the nations. Uh, again, uh, a voluntary question. Um, and um, that was four categories, straight, heterosexual, gay, lesbian, bisexual, or another writing um, sexual orientation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in England, Wales, and Scotland, we had a question on veteran status, st status. So this is people who were in the armed forces, but are no longer there. Um, there are separate uh, questions on, on for armed forces personnel. Um, this wasn't asked in Northern Ireland uh, because uh, it's, a, it, it's still a, um, a sensitive topic. Next slide, please. Um, we've got a new question on health conditions in Scotland and in Northern Ireland. Um, so in England and Wales, 
they just asked, "Are you? Um, do you have a long-term limiting illness?" and left it at that. Um, Northern Ireland, Scotland, they're asking what that illness is uh, within a. Uh, for, for Northern Ireland, it's a it's a tick list. Um, in Scotland, um, that's a writing. So that might be very telling with long COVID, for instance. Um, so we we'll, um, we'll look forward to seeing the, uh, the results from that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what the census can't tell us is there's, n there's no information on wealth, income. There's, so we derive, uh, derive our deprivation data using uh, information like uh, overcrowding, um, access to um, cars and vans, um, and um, socioeconomic grouping. Um, there's no uh, personal identification. Uh, they use data blowing and obfuscation to make sure that hopefully individuals cannot, well, as far as I know, no individual has ever been identified from um, census outputs. So, in theory, if you're a hitman and your target is of Chinese origin, living in Belfast, but following the Sikh religion, it might be possible that you are the only person in your particular out area. So what they will do is they will add a random number to that, one, two, th or three. And they might also swap your records with another similar type of uh, output area. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Census geography in this country is a little bit of a mess. In fact, geography in this country is a little bit of a mess. Um, because we have four different nations and four different governments, we have four different sets of geographies. Um, they all share the same building block, which is the output area, which is about, in England and Wales, it's about 125 our households. Um, however, in Scotland, it's about 50 households. So there is some difference there. From the output area, oh, the output areas are built after the census has been taken because they, they are socioeconomically heterogeneous, so uh, homogeneous, sorry. So they're designed to have a similar population. They're also designed to be, uh, to not spill over obvious um, geographical um, impediments. So motorways, for instance, um, rivers, etc. They are aligned, uh, aligned to local authority boundaries, so um, they don't split over. You know, they don't split over into different um, local authority areas. From the output, from the output area, we we create um, a set of geographies called super output areas, um, lower super output or middle super output areas in England and Wales, um, data zones and intermediate geographies in Scotland and um, in Northern Ireland, they just have lower super output areas. Um, these geographies are supposed to be little changing over the years so that you can use them for comparison with um, uh, older censuses. None of those geographies particularly relate to anything real. No one, no one gives their output area as their address. No one sends their um, their local taxes to a, a data zone. Um, so we also have on top of those, we have real geographies of regions, counties, local authorities, wards and electoral divisions, which have different names in all of the different um, nations. So there are no regions and counties and local authorities in Scotland, they have council areas. There is no postcode geography in the 
census outputs. There is an interface that we've created for um, matching and converting between geographies, and that is uh, called GeoConvert. Uh, the address is there. I think we might talk a bit about that later. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so the boundary data, the, ba the data that, that we can use to create maps, um, we have all that um, at um, the uh, a place called UK Borders uh, at Edinburgh, which is part of the UK Data Service. Uh, we've got data all the way back to 1981 in map info shape file, KML, CSV, all the all the um, most used um, mapping for, uh, formats. Um, one of our older interfaces, CASWeb, actually has 2001 and 1991 data and boundaries bundled together. So if you if you get data out of there, you can actually have it in a mapping format all all together, and you don't have to do the work of joining your map and data together. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we have a number of different interfaces to the census record data, um, which is has come about because we've been given money at different times to create new interfaces for new censuses. Infuse for data from 2001 to 2011, and that includes um, a combined UK um, data set. CASWeb for older data um, census data. And DCAN, it's currently only 2011, but we are loading 2001 into it um, at the moment. That's for bulk downloads of whole tables for whole nations, geographies, or um, whatever you want. If you, that's if you're doing bulk uh, analysis. Um, next slide, please. So um, deprivation data, there aren't any questions on income or wealth. So we, we use data from room occupancy, home ownership, tenancy, car availability, uh, employment status, et cetera, uh, to create a number of recipes, car stairs, Townsend, and the IMD, IOD. Um, they, they all use slightly different recipes for, for creating these, uh, these indices. Um, we have all that within uh, GeoConvert. So you can, add, you can add deprivation data to um, your uh, census data if you wish, or you can add it to, you can add it to um, postcode geography as well. Um, I think that's all I've got to say about deprivation data. Yeah, okay. Uh, if you want to match geographies, so um, it tends to be that if you're taking social survey data you, or, or you're asking questionnaires of people, you're asking for postcodes. If you then want to match postcodes to census geographies, we have a tool called GeoConvert, um, which uses um, Royal Mail address points within geographies to um, calculate uh, an area population and we then proportion those uh, that up, up to um, larger geographies. Um, you have to think about what you're attempting to do. Um, trying to aggregate, aggregate data up to very high levels, there'll be very large errors that can, uh, that can happen. Also, postcodes change a lot. And we do have information in there about when postcodes start and when postcodes terminate. The Royal Mail reuses postcodes. So you just have to be careful where, um, when, you're, when you're matching it to, to have a look and, and, and think, oh, there's an Aberdeen postcode here, but it's coming out uh, from a Portsmouth um, census geography. Uh, we've got um, lots of documentation on to our convert about how we how you can use that. Uh, next slide, please. I think I've already mentioned actually DCAM, um, bulk data. Um, we've created it around census themes, uh, very used to search, um, and uh, has lots of metadata in there as well. And as we say, it's, it's expanding all the time. 
And I think, yeah, if we have any questions. So um, what we're going to move on to is um, the ecolo ecological analysis. And in starting to talk about this, I'm aware that people may be at very different stages in terms of understanding um, the way that, that uh, these methods, what underpins these methods. So I'm going to go through some things which some of you may find easy and some of you may find quite complex. So I'm happy to answer questions um, as we go along, specifically about the, the contents of this. Um, but there'll be an opportunity at the end to wrap up as well. So if I don't get to your question um, during the session, we'll, we'll cover it at the end of explaining this before we get into the practical work. So first of all, um, spatial data is a particular form of data and it, it has, um, when you look at the files you've got, you have a number of different elements of those files. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about the key things. So the first is the projection, um, the second is shape, and then the kind of data we attach to places. So first of all, the, the challenge we have is we're taking something round the earth and translating it into something flat. And what that means is, depending on where you look at it from, look at the earth from, you get very different pictures. So we tend to look at maps of Norway um, from above somewhere around the equator. So Norway looks quite small, but if we move around our point of view, uh, to above Norway, it would suddenly become quite, it would become much larger. So the projection system is one where um, we derive our view and the data we're using, um, the spatial data we're using, derives that view from something generated by ONS, um, which uh, allows us to see the UK uh, more or less from above it when we map it. The second thing, um, that's there is our shape files, which um, are the way that we create boundaries on on a map. So um, in effect, it's a series of dots and we go through joining up those dots to create spatial areas. And then the final thing I'm going to cover is data types. So an aerial unit is a is a polygon, a shape, and um, they're given codes and names within data. So when you download data from census aggregate data, you will have codes that attach it to a particular geography. So in this example, we're looking at lower layer super output areas. We've got some data attached to them. Um, and when we create a shape file, we can attach to that the values associated with each aerial unit. Um, the second type of data is point data, and this is used to generate points on a map. So um, the two examples there are actually uh, tram stops in North Manchester. Um, so we can create an absolute place where those are and locate them on maps as well. So those are the two types of data we use. Um, if you were mapping individuals, uh, you could similarly put that data onto point data. Um, we talked a little bit, Dave talked a little bit about um, output area geography, um, which we're going to focus on. But in the example here, I just wanted to show the um, benefits of the output area geography or the differences between output area geography. So in the map at the top, we can see Greater Manchester. And this is showing the proportion of households in the private rented sector. So we can see uh, a proportion of around 30% in Manchester, which is the long, thin uh, local authority area. When we move down to the next layer of geography, which is a middle level super output area, there's 57 areas, and we can begin to see patterns of concentration. Um, the darker part in the lower part of the diagram is around the university, which is where um, there's lots of student accommodation and student halls. Um, and the part further up is near the city centre, where again, there's quite high concentration, quite high density. As we move down to lower layer super output areas, we can see this becoming more granular. granular. 
and the values now go between 5% and 90%. And finally, in output areas, um, we can see there's 1,530, and you can get some real levels of detail. So we've got some areas with no, um, nobody living in the private rental sector, up to 97%. So that's something about the geographies available and that would, um, using these techniques, you'd have to choose your geography depending on what you are linking to. Um, so in terms of COVID data, COVID case rates are published um, by Public Health England. <clears throat> um, there's a consolidated publication as well as the daily ones, which you may see in the news. There's a consolidated pub uh, publication of all the um, results, positive results from the last week released each week. Um, and that's held at mid-layer super output area. So that's the data we're going to be using because we're constrained by where the level of COVID cases are. Um, vaccination data isn't available at that level, so I couldn't include that within the, within the data source. Um, and we're using Greater Manchester um, to you could cover this across England, across um, across a region, et cetera, but Greater Manchester seems like about a reasonable size to, to give an example of how to use this data. Um, one of the things I provided is you've got two sets of shape files, and I wanted to show you the difference between them. So on the left, we have a physical map of data which is showing the COVID cases per 100,000 population at MSOA level in the first week of October, 2021. Um, so as you can see, that gives you a kind of picture which, which tells you something about where COVID cases are. But if we look on the right, the boundaries have been resized to reflect the population density. So those where the population density is higher, have become much larger. So you can see that Manchester has grown significantly um, in that map. Um, and that some of the outer areas have shrunk quite a lot. So you, if, you, if you pick out parts of that map, you'll be able to see um, both of those. Now, they both have their purposes. Um, so I've given you both options. Uh, so if you're writing for a policy audience or um, a more populist audience, then the physical geography probably works best. But if you're trying to show um, the extent, I suppose, of whatever variable you're mapping, then the cartogram uh, has some definite advantages. Um, so I'm going to now move on from those mapping basics into some of the principles of spatial analysis. So I'm going to go through these um, in a bit of detail, there's more on the slides, and I suspect this is the part where some people might want to stop and ask questions. But um, in terms of these principles, these are what you'll be applying in the workshops. So the first thing is what's called the modifiable aerial unit problem. And what this is, is that depending on where you join boundaries, you will get different values. So in the example here, you can see um, we've got a, a square with nine aerial units. To the right of that, we shifted that over um, to three units. Um, below that, we've got a different set of boundaries. And the final option is another set of boundaries. And if we look at what that creates, the red dots are showing where there's what look like um, errors between the, the spaces. So in terms of the boundaries, you're seeing quite different results. This particularly happens. Um, I suppose this, this randomness is one of the things that output areas were designed to try and overcome in terms of grouping areas of similar characteristics. But one note of caution here is, though that's true of the output area, it's not true of those things that are built together because those are built uh, contiguously. So um, we may well introduce area, error by going up from output area to lower layer, lower layer and mid layer super output areas. So that's what's called the modifiable aerial unit problem. It's something we, you might need to consider 
when looking at any analysis that uses spatial techniques. The next thing is, is spatial dependence. So um, if you think about where you live, um, sorry, I'll just answer Paul's question here, which is asking if, is it correct to assume that any physical representation of a place is at least slightly distorted? Yes, that's true. Um, just by the perspective that's taken on it. Um, so we can get close to representations we think are okay, but the representation we use for Greater Manchester is not taken from above Greater Manchester, it's a kind of UK-wide one. So spatial dependence is where there's a relationship between things. And I suppose if you think about the towns or cities or uh, villages or countryside you live in, um, you would probably think of certain places as having characteristics that were similar. So um, if you know Manchester, you would know that there are different parts of Manchester and some are regarded as affluent, not many of them. Um, some are regarded as places where there's lots of students. Some are regarded as places um, where there's quite high rates of poverty. And what that suggests is that within those areas, there is a kind of clustering effect. So that's what spatial dependence is. So if places around you are like the place you're in, then there is a level of spatial dependence. Um, the second kind of concept is heterogeneity. So this is something I think that geographers in London and people doing spatial analysis in London find quite a lot that what you, you're seeing is very different areas, very close together. Um, so it's, it's a kind of issue that will affect um, any calculations you do. So just to give you an example of spatial dependence, on the left-hand side, we have, again, a set of units, aerial units, um, with um, rates of burglary. So the lightest shading are low rates, um, the medium shading are medium rates are the high shading, the darker shading is high rates. Um, but if we look at income per household, we might expect there to be some correlation. So if you look at number six, then there are high rates of burglary and income per household is high. Um, so why isn't that happening in number 16? So one explanation might be that the um, higher rates of burglary surround a cluster of um, low rates of income. Um, that's not definitive, but it's something that you might wish to explore looking at that breakdown. Whereas on this pattern, which is fertility levels um, and female labor force participation, there doesn't really seem to be um, a correlation at all. Um, there are some patterns there, but there's, there's enough going on that suggests, um, so one and eight, for example, where there's high rates of fertility uh, correspond to low rates of female labor force participation in one and high rates in eight. Now, this might be because we haven't included something that would help us to explain uh, female labor force participation, or it might be there's just a factor that isn't affected by where you are. So moving on from there, what we try and detect is whether there's autocorrelation. So whether there's clustering of high or low values or negative clustering of neighbors with high and low values, like a chessboard pattern. And the effect of that autocorrelation in the error term in regression is to make estimates of the t-test values unreliable. Um, so positive spatial autocorrelation will increase the value of the R-square statistic and negative spatial autocorrelation will deflate it. So those are, are the kind of problems that come from um, a non-random distribution that is caused by spatial autocorrelation. correlation. 
So in order to kind of work out whether there is spatial autocorrelation, we need to generate some kind of value for a, an area, an aerial unit and its neighbors. And there are different ways of doing this. So um, one is based on areas that are next to each other. So contiguity. Um, one is based on distance. So you take the centroids of the polygons, the shapes, and calculate a distance. So if you say within 10 miles of this space, of this shape, then all of the um, units will be regarded as neighbors. And there's a set of kind of work throughs that go through that, that detect which neighbor, uh, which aerial unit should have which particular neighbor. Or you can limit the number of nearest neighbors. Um, now, I think just to say here, I tended, I've, I've used this technique for a number of years. I tend not to use distance because it, it does um, cause issues with more densely populated areas. So I tend to use contiguity. And for the workshop, we will use a contiguity measure. So looking at those, there are two commonly used ones. So um, on the left, we can see um, a first order rook. So this is based on chess playing. A rook can move up and down and sideways. So what you do is take the area units above, below, to the left and to the right. And the second is the first order queen, which takes all touching units. So it takes all of those that are adjacent to the unit you're looking at. Um, those, and you could also limit the number of neighbors, so it, it will cut them down by um, some calculation. Um, so that's the first order. Uh, if you were looking at large geographies with lots of units, you can also go up to second order, which would move these out another area. So it would go um, on the rock side, go up one, left, up one more, left one more, right one more, and down one more. And with the queen, it would move out another block. So having generated that, we can then look at spatial autocorrelation. So um, I put the formula there, I'm not gonna go through it, um, but Moran's eye was developed and what it returns is a value between one and minus one. And it's a diagnostic that tells you if there's spatial autocorrelation. So one is complete spatial autocorrelation, my positive autocorrelation, and minus one is negative autocorrelation. Um, a value of zero or close to zero would imply there's no uh, autocorrelation. And what we get is a plot. So in effect, what this plot is doing is taking that value for the aerial unit um, and the average value for the weighted areas. So in the um, in this example, this is a queen's contiguity first level weighting. So it's taking the average or the mean of the variable across those units and then plotting them against each other. So what this is suggesting is that similar places um, are grouped together. So the, the direction is um, a positive, uh, space, suggesting positive spatial autocorrelation. Um, the next thing we can do is look at how this is happening in each aerial unit. So um, again, a formula on the local indicators of spatial association, which are used to generate LISA maps. So um, let's have a, have a look at them. So what this is showing is, an, on the left-hand side, is a map of areas. I haven't put the variable on here, which is a bit poor on my part. So this is a physical map of Greater Manchester, and it's showing the types of areas that are congregated together. So those areas that are red are high values of this variable surrounded by 
high values in the neighboring areas. So you can see the clusters of red around the outside uh, to the north um, and in parts of the um, of other boroughs there. And the blue is low surrounded by low. So this is where there are low values of the indicator um, surrounded by them. I think this was an indicator I generated for a training program, which is based on hard working, a hard working index. So there are a few light, light blue areas, which is low, value, low values surrounded by high values. And there's a few pink ones, which are high values surrounded by low values. So that's the map on the le left, the LISA map. Quite commonly, that's produced with an indicator of statistical significance. So the darker the green shading, um, the more stati statistically significant uh, the values are. Um, these can be generated. They're quite often published together. And the colors are um, a kind of convention that is used in producing and talking about these maps. So when we move on from there to multivariate analysis, we have a basic linear regression model, which is a constant um, coefficient for each of the variables selected and an error term. Um, when we think about spatial autocorrelation, we think that the error term may vary between the spatial units. So in the example here, um, survival probabilities in the event of a heart attack are likely to depend on the distance to the hospital. Um, we could also take into account the severity of the heart attack. Um, you could also let the intercept vary in the model. So what we get to is after including all the variables that we think are meaningful, we may still get a significant result in the Moran's eye. So that's the global measure. Um, and what might be um, causing that is spatially correlated variables that are emitted, spatially correlated errors in variable measurement, and things we haven't considered, interactions we haven't considered. And to address this, we can use two models. We can use a spatial lag model, which takes account of positive uh, of spatial dependency or a spatial error model, which takes account of spatial heterogeneity. So in thinking about spatial lag, we use a lag value of the dependent variable. So we take the dependent variable we're looking at and we look at the lag value, i.e. that's the mean value of that area unit and the one surrounding it. Um, in the case of a Queen's order. Thing. And the result that comes out is a parameter called rho. So if you do a spatial lag regression, you'll get a parameter called rho. Um, and in terms of spatial error, um, the results are put in a, a term called lambda. And those are both estimated by maximum likelihood. Um, so, in terms of deciding whether there's spatial autocorrelation, you've got some diagnostics. In deciding which approach to use, um, you can do this either through theoretical considerations or exploratory data analysis. Um, within the regression model in Geoda, and um, this is available also at least in R and Stata, um, there are diagnostic tests that give the Lagrange multiplier and robust Lagrange multiplier, which identify whether there's lag and or error. So if we assume that there is no spatial autocorrelation, uh, we would use a standard regression model. Um, so that is the process we'll go through later on. Um, we then look at the multiplier lag being significant or the error being significant. Um, so if one is significant and the other isn't, it would point us to one of the models. If both tests are significant, we can use the robust statistics 
um, and again choose one or the other. There are some cases where both will be significant, in which case you may well end up presenting your three sets of results. So your standard regression model, spatial lag model, and spatial error model. So um, I'm, we're going to move on to the workshop in a bit. We're gonna have some questions, um, but what we'll be doing is using Geoda to load the data, um, explore some of the descriptive statistics available um, within Geoda, produce weights, and then explore the kind of clustering and sparsity using LISA maps, exploring spatial autocorrelation, and then moving on to regression. Now, a note of kind of um, caution here, I suppose in designing this workshop, we was thinking that the 2021 census is gonna give us some really good data to be able to explore elements of this. But in developing this, I've used the 2011 data. So quite a lot of that data may well have changed. Um, so the, the the nature of places, the kind of people that live there, et cetera, may well have changed. And in testing these results, a number of the coefficients don't give you um, significant results. Um, so what we're doing in the workshop is really exploring. Now, the two I've given you, uh, the two examples I've given you in the workbook do produce some significant results and do have something to discuss. Um, but it, I think it's fair to say that I would assume that using 2021 data when it's available is much more likely to be to predict um, levels of COVID cases. The other thing to say is that, that the, the case data that we're using comes from 13 months, so from October 2020 through to October 2021. And um, the way that COVID has changed over that time has been quite significant. So there have been what are commonly called hotspots. <clears throat> so um, I was teaching at another university in October 2020, and the areas where the students live became a particular hotspot of that time. Um, the cases went through the roof. And I think that movement of students to university um, was quite significant in many places. Um, last October, whereas in different times it will be related to different reasons. So the early cases were very much associated with health staff. And if we can isolate where health staff live, we might get some indicators. So um, of that as a part. Okay, it doesn't look at this stage like we have any questions. Um, now, you're going to have to help me here and tell me if you can see the screen, because what I'm going to do next is to um, move on to quickly demonstrating Geoda. So, um, okay, so this is the interface. Open this. So this won't resize. Geoda, um, if you're site isn't the best is a strange um, menu but um, to start with it has a menu across the top uh, a number of icons which relates that menu so the first thing i'm going to do is to open a shape file so i go to file open shape file and this the workbook that you should have access to and we'll drop the link again in chat um, will take you through these steps yourself. So I'm going to open the cartogram of um, the MSOAs in Greater Manchester. So you can see this is now um, a map of Greater Manchester. Um, I've just highlighted one of them. Um, so what this is doing on the left-hand side, it tells you how many units there are. 346 MSOAs. Um, and as you can see, it's a cartogram. So the areas have been leveled out in terms of size. Um, so the next thing I'm going to do is just explore some of that data. So I can go in and look 
for example, at a histogram, um, which will give me the frequency distribution. And it comes up with all the variables. So let's just pick um, May 21. And that shows me the distribution. So we can see that there's a few areas with quite high rates, but there's a lot with quite low rates in May 21. Um, and I can't see a map right now, Nigel. So, sorry if I'm misunderstanding, but I can just see the, the menu up close. Can you see the histogram? I c it says histogram crate May 21, but then it's just a menu below it. Right, okay. Um, I'll, I'll go back and... Right, now, can you see my screen now? Yeah, I can see the map and it's um, it's a bit more zoomed out as well, which is, is good. We can see the it really clearly. Okay. Um, so I'm going to have to flip between the menu and so on. So the next thing I did was then go into Explore and look at Histogram. And I picked the rate for May. And what that gave me was another pop-up window. And I'll enlarge that a bit. Can you see that? Yeah. OK, so what, as I was saying, that's showing a number of areas, more than 200 with, with low numbers of cases and just a few with quite high numbers of cases. So there's one over here with 570, I think, if I'm reading that right. Um, now, I'm going to shut a couple of these windows down just to go to the next one. OK, so um, back into my Geoda menu, the next area of exploring um, you can look at is a box plot. So that is similar. It gives you a distribution. Um, I'll do it again for the same value. And it gives a simple box plot of one variable. So you can't put multiple variables in here, just one. So it gives you a way of exploring the data to see how it's distributed in terms of um, values. And you can see the outliers at the top. I'll close that again. You could compare two variables. So if I was to take that rate in May and compare that to um, the proportion of students, let's see if there's any relationship. And it's suggesting there's no relationship in May 21 case rates with the proportion of students in, um, in an area. But if I was to do that, with the October 20 case rates, the picture is quite different. So if you can see those two scatter plots, you can see in October 2020, there was an issue associated with students. Um, so those areas with high proportions of students appear to have high levels of cases, whereas there's apparently no relationship by the time we come to May 2021. OK, so I'm going to close down those two scatter plots. So that is probably about it for the, um, I mean, there are other plots there. You can explore them. Um, the next stage would be to go into tools and to generate your weights. Um, now, I've already done that. But I will show you the screen just to show you how you do it. So you create it. Um, you add in an ID variable, and then you select what type you want. So if I click on Queen Contiguity, um, I'm going with those right next to it, create it, and I can save that as a file. Um, and now I can use that when I move on to looking at the next stage. So that's a one-off stage. Um, 
Um, so now I can move into these, which are the diagnostics. So I can look at the Moran's eye, which we talked about. So this will plot a variable and say, is there any relationship with places around it? So let's pick a different month. Let's go for January 21. And this is plotting uh, the rate in January 21 in an area with the weight surrounding it. So we've put in a Queen's weight, Queen's contiguity weight. So this is saying there is some positive autocorrelation um, between these, and it's giving a Moran's eye value of 0.22 something. Um, so I should make that a bit bigger again. So that's plotting those variables. So back into Geoda. Um, if I go into space again, um, I can also look at the local area. So if I look at the local Moran's eye for the same area, it gives me a set of options. So I can produce the significance map. That was the green one to show statistical significance, the cluster map, and the Moran scatter plot. So if I just click on OK with that, I get three different maps. So let's have a look at them each in turn. So three different figures. So this is the clustering of um, COVID-19 cases in June 20, in January 21. So we can see some red places where there seem to be quite high rates of clusters, some blue places where there's quite low rates, and then the light blue where there's low surrounded by high, and the pink where there's high surrounded by low. And a large part of the map is not significant. And we could look at the statistical significance of those as well. So you could present those two maps together, potentially, um, if you're explaining what you've done. And last, I've got the Moran's eye, which we saw before. So we can explore those different variables that we might think about in a model um, using those different techniques. Finally, we could look at methods and where we get here is the regression. So um, I'm going to pick a different time. Um, so the first thing I do, can you see this by the way? The um, regression screen. Yeah. yeah. So, on the left, I pick, I've got a set of the variables. So if I pick a dependent variable of January 21, which we were just looking at, and um, I'm going to try using um, the concentration of people who work in health, education, and emergency services. So at the moment, I've got no weights file. So if I click that on, I get the weights file. And I'm running, a first of all, a standard regression. So this just runs a classic regression and produces an output file um, with those coefficients. So um, this is telling me that up here, that this is not explaining an awful lot of variance, 2%. Um, that there's a positive effect um, for health, but it's not statistically significant. There's a negative effect for education, it's not statistically significant. And there's a negative effect for the emergency services, which is statistically significant. Now, thinking about what these coefficient mean, coefficients mean, um, what they mean is that for each unit increase in the value of um, this, um, this coefficient, the effect on the COVID case rate is minus 4279 in this case. So for each percentage increase in the proportion of blue light people living in a neighborhood, um, there's a reduction of 42.7 or 42.8 in the case levels.
Okay, so that's the first part of the model. Now, the second part of the model here gives you the diagnostics. So what this is saying is um, the lag model is statistically significant. So there is a spatial lag effect. And it's also saying the error model is statistically significant, but neither of the robust tests is significant. So what we can do with this is to go back to the regression model that we've got here. And we could try the spatial lag effect and see what happens. And we get another regression report for this. Um, and if we look at the results, we've got some changes here. So the result of include introducing spatial lag leaves health very significant, uh, sorry, very similar result, but not statistically significant. It shows that education is now statistically significant and has a negative effect. Uh, and the um, those working in emergency services is statistically significant, but the effect has reduced. So I'm just going to part that one over here and try spatial error and just see what happens with that. So what this has done has changed those results again, and it's given you a, a lambda effect, but it's saying the only significant effect is education, people working in education. Um, now, I kept this fairly simple. I think if I was thinking about this, I might be thinking about how I could isolate health staff who are at the front line from people who are managing, um, et cetera. So I, I might be using... Uh, the, the NSSEC social classes uh, to try and isolate um, people in particular occupations. So the census gives a broad occupational space of health. It gives three or four different categories and I've combined them here. So in effect, what I've done is run through the ways that we'll be using um, geodas. 